My family in Christ, as I said before this service, this is our last Sunday in the First Corinthians series, and it's been kind of a long journey, right? And I don't know if you remember how we began, but we actually didn't, didn't begin First Corinthians with chapter 1. Instead, we began First Corinthians in chapter 15 on Easter morning, back when we celebrated verses like these. Where the Apostle Paul said, Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is right at about the end of the book of 1 Corinthians. But really, it's these verses that set the tone for what 1 Corinthians was all about. As the Apostle Paul wrote to these Christians living in the Las Vegas of the ancient world, he wrote to these Corinthians that dealt with infighting and elitism and all of these different situations that they were struggling through. Really, these verses is what it's all about. Why the Corinthians would gather together at all. It wasn't to discuss philosophy. It wasn't to make sure they were living proper, moralistic lives. They could have done that anywhere. They could have met Stoic philosophers that made sure that they gave to the poor. They could have met Epicureans who made sure they were feeling good about themselves. But instead, they gather, gathered together as the body of Christ because nowhere else could you find something like this. Nowhere else could you have the hope of eternal life laid out for you. Nowhere else could you have the gift of faith planted in your heart to trust that this is true. It's this reason that rich and poor, Gentiles and Jews, all people gather together as a body of Christ. Because nowhere else do you have the inevitable, uncurable problem of death taken care of. And so it's this reason that the diverse body of the Christians gather together at all. It's the reason we gather together today. Because over the last couple of months, as we've been looking at the issues the Corinthians dealt with, we've noticed that a lot of what they deal with is what we deal with today. Because sin doesn't change. Sinful nature doesn't change. It still wants the opposite of what God's will is. And so we've seen that even though the Bible doesn't directly address every single, everyday situation that you might face, God still addresses sin. He still gives the answer to sin. And he still guides us through this new life he's given us by giving us the principles of how to proclaim that answer in every part of our lives. And that's what we've been witnessing. And so today it, it makes sense that we kind of have the umbrella topic of love to close it out with. And maybe we talk a lot about love at peace at church. Maybe we hear a lot about love all of the time. But we're going to see why love is so essential for us as we consider our relationship with God and our relationship with one another in the body of Christ. Why love is so essential as you go and leave the doors of this church and travel out into our community. Why is love such an essential thing? Because again, a lot of people talk about love. A lot of people know that love is good. But what makes love essential? That's what makes 1 Corinthians 13 such a beautiful chapter. Because it, it kind of wipes the slate clean. It doesn't allow us to fill in our own definition for love, but instead it lays out what God's definition is so that we could see what essential love really looks like. And so what we're going to do is we're going to dive right into our first few verses today as the Apostle Paul lays out for us his argument for why love is so essential. So please follow along for our first few verses. He says, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. This is the word of God. Now, if you've known me for more than five minutes, you probably know that I love coffee. It's, it's my blanket. It's what's always around me. 
always in me. I love coffee. My daughter has a little Winnie the Pooh stuffed animal that she always carries around. My son has a little dog stuffed animal that he always carries around. I always have my cup of coffee. And so in the morning, it always begins with me putting coffee beans in my grinder and pushing the button and waking up everything everywhere. It's like this jet engine coffee grinder that will wake up children, wife, animals, everybody. But it gets some coffee beans ground. And that's worth it. But I love coffee, so I do that every day. But you know what? Please believe me when I say I do love my wife more than coffee. <laughs> and so when we talk in the mornings, we're talking about our day, kind of talking about what's ahead. Do you think my wife would feel loved if while she was talking to me, I went over to the coffee grinder while she was talking and pushed Do you think she would feel loved? No. No, because I would clearly be ignoring her and prioritizing my coffee over her. Now, I actually haven't done that. But that would be incredibly unloving. I could talk all I want about how I love her and I want her to have a good day. But if I don't actually show that love, well then, what am I really saying to her? Remember, if, if you were here last week, the Apostle Paul in this context is talking about all of these different spiritual gifts the Corinthians had. All of these different unique gifts everyone had to add to the body of Christ to serve one another and to serve their God in this world. But in 13, he pauses and says, all of those gifts you have are worthless if love is not at the center of it. You can do all the prophesying you want, but if you don't love the people you're prophesying to, you might as well just turn on the coffee grinder because it's not communicating what you want it to. You can have all of the abilities to speak in tongues of heaven, but if you don't have love behind why you're doing it, it's just like, turning up music really loud to the point where your ears hurt. You might be really good at being generous and giving, but if you don't love the people you're giving to, it's useless. You gain nothing. And so it makes us kind of think twice about the way we live our everyday lives with the gifts he has given us. Last week, we talked all about how each one of us have a unique thing given to us. How we're uniquely part of this body of Christ to live out the body of Christ. But how do we do it matters. Because remember how communication works. It's not just the words that I say, but it's how they're received too. How I present somebody, even with truth, it matters how they feel about the way I'm telling them. Now, I might be able to tell you exactly what you need to hear, but if I don't actually love you when I'm saying it, it's not going to do anybody any good. It's just like turning on that coffee grinder, blocking out everything that I might say. The Apostle Paul says love is essential as you deal with one another. Are you more interested in demonstrating your abilities or are you interested in benefiting somebody else? Are you more interested in how people perceive you as knowledgeable or faithful or godly or do you care about helping and showing that love to the people around you? How you go about demonstrating and living out your gifts in a loving way matters. Because you might have tons of good things to say to somebody, you might have lots of good ways to help people, but if you're not doing it out of love, it is going to do nobody any good. So that kind of begs the question, what is good love? What is the good kind of love we're supposed to be using when we talk to one another, as we interact with one another? Well, the Apostle Paul uses this special word for love. It's agape. We've talked about this before, that in the Greek language, there are different words for love. This agape love isn't the kind of love that expects something in return. This agape love isn't the kind of love that's based on how I feel right now, which we all know we feel differently in five minutes. Agape love is the love 
says, you are valuable just because. You are important and deserving of this love, not because of anything you give back to me, but simply because I love you. This is the agape love that's behind everything that we do when we speak to one another as we interact with each other. Whenever we use these unique gifts given to us, they are driven and empowered by this love. And it's important for other people to see that. They might not always want to admit that love, but they have to at least know it's there. Because otherwise, what do we benefit? So now we know what agape love is, but what does agape love look like? And Apostle Paul goes on to give a beautiful description of what agape love looks like. And maybe you've heard it before at weddings or in cards. Beautiful, beautiful verses, but we're going to see why these verses are so important, not just because they're quotable, but because they describe essential love in such an important way. So please follow along. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. This is the word of God. You just kind of bask in that description, right? So precise. So many different facets are a part of it. You could, we could do a whole sermon series on each and every aspect of that kind of love. But now here's my question. What were you thinking about as you read those verses? Were you thinking about the love that you want somebody to show you? Or were you thinking about how can I show this kind of love to others? Naturally, our go-to reaction is usually, oh, I'm thinking, why doesn't my wife, she, oh, she hasn't always loved me in that, that way. Or, oh, if my parents could just remember that aspect of love, we could get along so much better. But that's what the Apostle Paul is trying to point out. That one way to look at this list, one way that God wants to use this list, is to use it as a mirror. To hold up this mirror in front of you and to say, is this how you love? When you think about all the different people you say that you love, a spouse, friends, family, are these the things that you do? Are you, are you patient with your kids? Are you kind? Do you remember to not be proud but to be humble? Do you put them first instead of being selfish? Do you, do you remember not to keep a record of wrongs? but to actually forgive? Do you rejoice in, in the true things of the world instead of letting the sinful lies of the world distract you and take you away? Is this how you love? Maybe if you're like me, you can say, oh, yesterday I totally did that. There was that time where I was patient, or last week I, I remember to forgive. But then you, re you read verse 7. And what word just drives it all home? Always, 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 always this kind of love. Not just once a week or every other day. It's, it's always patient, always kind, always self-seeking. And then, and then you remember the way that God talks about love in the Bible. You remember that Jesus didn't talk about loving just your family and your friends. He said, love your neighbor. And love your enemies. So always, 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 even those who don't benefit me, always. Always love, always love, even those who maybe hurt me a lot. And that mirror, the image reflecting back doesn't look too pretty, does it? 
And so these verses get read at weddings all the time and on all these cards, but God actually uses this as a mirror to reflect not what is beautiful, but what is ugly. And that's me. I do not always, always agape. And that's really important for us to realize. Because then we get to see love in the other way. Then we get to see the other way that God extends this love to us. Not, as, not to see this description as a mirror, but to see it as, as a telescope that, that hones right in on the one who does always, always love in this way. To let you kind of tunnel vision in on the one who is always patient with you, never self-seeking, who is always forgiving, never keeping a record of wrongs. To let you see your Savior that much more clearly. To let you see how Christ in his ministry always, always lived this love, seeking out not the healthy but the sick, not always spending time with the righteous but with the sinners, always, always, always. So that you could know that you, first and foremost, are always, always loved in this way. Remember those words we just read from Matthew? Oh, where did I put them? Here they are. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. For I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. It is the love of Christ that takes that mirror away and says, stop looking at yourself and look at me. Look at how I have always lived this love perfectly for you. It is this love of Christ that says, stop looking at your guilt with a microscope and instead look at me and see how I have healed you of your disease. And I forgive you. I forgive you for the times when you were not patient. I forgive you for the times when you were self-seeking. I forgive you for the times when you kept that list so long. This is the whole reason that I have taken your sin and separated it from you as far as east is from the west because I am the one who does not keep record of wrongs. I love you. Always, always. And so as you see that list, know that that's how God loves you. See that list as the description of the way Christ sees you every day, taking your guilt away and making you whole again, taking your sh shame away and placing his glory, his perfect love on top of you so that you are glorious now. That is what the love of God does. So as you consider love, maybe I just always keep, always, always keep this Bible verse in the back of your head. If you haven't memorized it, memorize it. 1 John 4, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to sacrifice for our sins. That God would love you even when you had nothing to give back to him. That God loved you when you were most sick with your sin is when he was willing to give his life for you because God's agape love never changes. And that's the love you possess. And this is the love that sometimes gets cloudy, sometimes the love we can get confused about. And that's, that's the way the Apostle Paul describes it in the next section when he says this. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. I love my children very, very much. And I know they love me. But how they show that love can change depending on a number of factors. How much sleep has happened? How much food they have in their tummy at the time? How often I've done things that they want me to do? They can go from giving me the biggest hug, I love you, daddy, to crying and kicking on the floor because I didn't play the right song on my phone. The love of a child is fickle and changing. And Apostle Paul knows that that's the love that we all naturally have with each other. So he says, grow up. 
Agape love is a mature love. And we might have all these different gifts in the world, but he says, you know what? At the end of the day, love each other with that agape love, and that is the greatest gift you can give each other. But it means growing up a little bit. It means looking in that mirror sometimes and admitting when it's not very pretty, but when it is ugly. It means taking the time to look at your Savior's love and getting filled up with that love because remember, God isn't asking you to pour out your perfect love on somebody else. God is asking you to pour out His perfect love on somebody else. So that means you need to get filled up by that love. That's how you grow up. You grow up rooted deeply in the love of Christ and then you can bear the fruit of showing that love to others. So the Apostle Paul closes out with these thoughts. He says, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. What he's saying is that right now, we don't always see this perfect love in the world. We don't always see this perfect love enacted in the church. We may even have a hard time really understanding how God's perfect love affects us right now. But he's saying, someday, when we are in heaven and away from sin for good, you will know fully what that love looks like. You will know fully what your perfect God looks like. You will know fully what your God's will is for you. And so right now, it's true, we kind of see the reflections, and sometimes the reflections are a little bit fuzzier than other times. But he says, remember this. Remember how essential and great love is. Because whenever we think about how essential love is, really we're remembering how essential God is. Because remember the way the Apostle John described him. He, he says God is love. And so when we have that love at the forefront of our minds, when that love is at the forefront of the way we treat each other, well then we're kind of knowing God in the best way possible. As we remind ourselves the love that God has shown to us in the perfect way, that's what bears that fruit of showing that love to others. And as other people see that essential agape love permeating everything that we do, they get to see God a little bit more clearly too. And that really is the greatest thing of all. To always remember God's love in your life to always help somebody else remember God's love in their life too. And so, and so as you remember that agape love and that memorize that 1 John 4 verse, remember the people that you show love to, it's, they're not perfect. They, they are kind of a reflection of something kind of dirty. But that doesn't mean they don't get to be loved. Remember to pour out to them, not, not yourself, emptying yourself all the time, but pour out to them the love that transforms that agape love of Christ. Not because it's easy, but maybe because it's hard. Because they're not going to get that love anywhere else. They're not going to receive the essential love unless they receive it from Christ, maybe through you. Because as essential as that love is in your life, it's just as essential in theirs, no matter who they are, or what they look like. Christ's love given to you, maybe we can give it to them. Amen. Please pray with me now. Dear Heavenly Father, we just give thanks to you for the gift of your love. That as we realize that our love often does not line up with the picture of love you have placed in front of us, we remember the love of your forgiveness and the love of your empowerment that we may spread your love to other people, that they can enjoy this essential agape love in their lives just as much as we do. In your name we pray. Amen.